Good afternoon, everyone. It's after our allotted starting time. We always give a couple of minutes. This has become an annual tradition to see whether we have reached quorum of 150 people, and we have not. So that means that, yet again, the motion to approve Kerr and King as the, uh, and, and our mover and seconder are here, as the document of choice for this assembly will have to be deferred. But uh, it also means that you still have to listen to me give the General Academic Assembly address, and I'm very proud to do that. Thank you all very much for coming here. I see members of Senate, members of our Board of Governors, lots of students, student council reps, student leaders, graduate students, administrators, many staff. Terry Downey is here, president of STM. Thank you very much for being here, Terry, and uh, I thank all of you. I do have a speech to give, and it'll be uh, one that, that I read, but I did want to say a couple of things off the top. First of all, welcome to those of you who are following this live streamed. You picked a good day not to have to be here, given the temperature I felt this morning, anyway. Um, and uh, I'm glad that you are taking the time to, to follow this important uh, event. I consider it very important. And I just wanted to thank all of you for the support that you have given me over the last two and a half years and counting as president of this great institution. It's been a wonderful privilege for me. Nothing better could have happened in my life, and it's always uh, terrific to be able to give this GAA address, which actually is my third. I can hardly believe that. I've tried to make them into a series and to link them uh, along the lines of certain themes. I think you'll hear that today. So thank you very much for being here. It's a very important occasion. It's an opportunity as legislated in the University of Saskatchewan Act for the president to be able to give a sort of state of the university address or as I read with some bemusement, anything else that he or she thinks is important. But I think I'll stick to the university. <laughs> So I begin by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 6 territory in the traditional homeland of the Métis and we pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. The theme of my GAA addresses over the last two years has been that universities are more important now than they have ever been. And as a result, the University of Saskatchewan is more important now than it has ever been. And if that's true, we are required to ask ourselves, how do we accept that responsibility? How do we respond to the increased need that people have for universities and for the U of S? Either those people who attend here as students or those who are not students but are influenced by all that we do. How are we able to contribute in the ways people need us to contribute given the world that we inhabit today. One answer, and I offered this in my first GAA speech a couple of years ago, is for us to identify the features that are shared by great universities so that we can focus on them as we develop and evolve. I suggested while those features are numerous, the key elements are connectivity, sustainability, diversity, and creativity. And these features are foundational to our vision, mission, and values document, which in turn, and I think this is important to emphasize, has informed our proposed university plan. I believe that we got that vision right. We will contribute to a sustainable future by being among the best in the world in areas of special and emerging strengths through outstanding research, scholarly, and artistic work that addresses, and I underline this part, the needs and aspirations of our region and the world and through exceptional teaching and engagement. To me, global excellence, our many forms of discovery and the commitment to engaging with what the world needs, the importance of teaching, all of these things are there and they are embraced by the imperative of contributing to a sustainable future and the many forms that that contribution can take. It follows then that our proposed university plan begins with the statement that we will be the university the world needs. 
The proposed plan essentially responds to that question that I asked a couple of minutes ago. How are we able to contribute in the ways people need us to contribute given the world that we now inhabit? How are we going to govern ourselves not only on the basis of what we want to be, but what the world needs us to be? How are we, put another way, going to design ourselves to be the university for the future? And not just any university for the future, but the university that with our unique strengths we can be for the, for the, for the future. Two, so importantly, how are we going to do so in financially challenging circumstances for us and for the province, during which many of us have foregone opportunities for change due to lack of sufficient resources to carry them out, during which time the university has had to reduce its workforce numbers, its costs through voluntary exit programs, to suspend academic programs, to reduce budgets in all units across this campus, and to search for aggressive cost-cutting strategies everywhere. A couple of facts, I could give you many more. Base grant funding, the amount used to operate this university is less now than it was in 2012-13 and has been reduced by $91 million since 2014-15. Last year's provincial sales tax budget decision increases in utility costs above the general rate of inflation each year, even as we achieve results in reducing the overall usage. Mid-year clawbacks, uncertainty over College of Medicine funding, these continue to emphasize the need for us to plan. And we need to plan well by focusing on our mission and by enhancing revenues such as increasing enrollment in areas of student demand, reducing expenses, guaranteeing financial sustainability, and ensuring exceptional quality in all that we do. Those are important and weighty issues. And I believe that just as with the vision document, we have succeeded in addressing them in our proposed university plan. It's been approved by council and it goes to Senate in two weeks and to the Board of Governors in June. That's why I'm calling it still a proposed plan. Time will tell, history will judge, but I believe the plan's integrity is in the fact that it has looked those questions in the eye. It identifies what this university needs to concentrate on in order to be the university for the future. So I'd like to speak about the tremendous successes we've had this past year, all of us have had this past year, how they predict we will fulfill the bold goals of our proposed plan, remind us of why it's important to have a bold plan at a time of ongoing financial constraints, and why it's important to design ourselves to be an outward-looking university for the future. So how can we be the university for the future? I've argued before that many rankings mechanisms not proficient at asking this question are even less proficient at answering it and therefore evaluate universities along less consequential lines and along the same lines year after year, even though so much has changed. Our proposed plan, I argue, has not made the same mistake. One way to be a university for the future is to engage with and to be seen to be engaging with what the world needs us to be. That is our value proposition to deliberately confront humanity's greatest challenges and opportunities, part of the courageous curiosity that is the first commitment of our proposed plan. Our way to be the university for the future is to identify which of those challenges we should confront given our unique strengths, six signature areas, two CFREFs, and so on, and then confront them. The confidence that runs through the plan is due to the fact that we're no longer a university only of promise and potential, but a university that is now realizing that potential. What is the recent evidence for that confidence? There is much. A few examples. Using our state-of-the-art cyclotron, we're producing medical isotopes for the diagnosis and treatment of cancer, a fitting homage to the Cobalt 60 work that was done here decades ago. 
Since June of 2016, we've been supplying Royal University Hospital with all its medical isotopes instead of RUH having to bring them in from Hamilton, Ontario. This is of enormous significance given the closure of Chalk River just last week, March 31st. As a result, over 2,000 patients have received PET-CT scans near their homes and families instead of having to travel to health centres in other provinces. We're a national leader in community-engaged health research, particularly in using robotic technology, whimsically called doctor in a box, to deliver health care to people in the north so they don't have to leave their homes. This also reduces costs for the provincial health system. And new remote telerobotic health techniques, such as long-distance ultrasound imaging, are changing how we diagnose and treat chronic diseases for people without access to larger medical centres. If our community-engaged health research is at the vanguard of change, identifying community needs and helping solve them, so is our crop development work. The U of S has become Canada's leading hub for crop genomics. At our Global Institute for Food Security, we are combining cutting-edge plant science with computational techniques to transform the breeding of crops, including wheat, canola, and lentils. We are succeeding in improving drought, pest, and stress resistance in crops, and our goal is to be a unique resource for plant breeders around the world by 2022. These are examples of how we are already confronting humanity's greatest challenges and opportunities as our plan's first commitment, Courageous Curiosity, asks us to do. In the process, we become a talent magnet for the U of S, the city of Saskatoon, and our province. In the last two years, we've attracted Yolanda Seddon, recipient of a recently announced NSERC Industrial Research Chair in the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, Canada Excellence Research Chair Leon Koshin from Cornell University to help lead our efforts in food security research, Alexandra King from Simon Fraser University to be our first Cameco Chair in Indigenous Health, and Jay Familietti from the Jet Propulsion Labs in Pasadena as one of the new Canada 150 research chairs, 24 in total across the country were just announced last week in Ottawa, he was one of them, to help lead our efforts in water security research. As a result of bringing such talent here, we are creating a culture of excellence and diversity that will increase our attractiveness to students and researchers and staff globally, enabling us to contribute further to the world's greatest challenges in our unique way. And I'd like to take the opportunity also to thank Jackie Ottman, our new Vice Provost Indigenous Engagement, most recently from the University of Calgary. Guy LaRock, our new AVP Alumni Relations, most recently from York University. And Darwin Roy, most recently from Lac La Lorange Indian Band as our new Executive Director of Community Relations for joining us as well. All under that category of us being a talent magnet because of what we're doing here. As an aside, Attracting just one of those research talents meant we climbed in the Shanghai ARWU rankings by 100 places this past year. Another feature of the University for the Future, it's our proposed plan's second commitment, boundless collaboration, that asks us to invigorate the impact of collaboration in everything that we do. We have the confidence that this is possible, at the U of S because of our tendency to be collaborative. We say as much in our vision document, we have a well-deserved reputation for creativity, collaboration, and achievement. We now need to turn that reputation into further success, and we say this in the proposed plan, by growing the number, diversity, and scale of local, national, and international partnerships in research, scholarship, and training, and we say that in the second commitment. We have been doing this recently as well. In the past two years, we've signed an MOU with the other 23 post-secondary institutions in this province to close the education gap with Indigenous people, an MOU with the FSIN, with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, with artistic institutions, the Ramey Modern and the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra, and most recently with the city of Saskatoon. Almost all of these are firsts of a kind in this country. 
and we've signed many with institutions like ours around the world to solve challenges together and to share students so that they are prepared, as we say in our vision document, for enriching careers and fulfilling lives as engaged global citizens. We're an integral part of the Protein Industries Canada Supercluster announced in February. Over 50 proposals were submitted last summer, reduced to nine in the late fall, and then to five successful ones just in February. Over 120 small, medium, and large businesses, several universities, NGOs, and other institutions from the Prairie Provinces are involved, but we are, by far, the most research intensive of these universities, and by far, the most experienced in the necessary agricultural, food security, and public policy research this supercluster's work depends upon. These many partnerships are more than aspirational words. They are public acknowledgments of our proposed plan's second commitment, boundless collaboration that we will keep, underscoring our mission to build a rich cultural community. I've been focusing on our global and national impact in many of these examples, but I want to emphasize the importance of our partnership with the City of Saskatoon. Keep in mind that the U of S owns 18% of the land within a five kilometer radius of downtown, pays seven and a half million dollars in municipal taxes, is responsible for 40% of the bus users, is connected to many local charities, offers many sports programs for children, and offers health and legal services in the inner city. And that's just a small set of examples. We have an enormous responsibility to Saskatoon and we need to honor it. Great cities need and great cities deserve great universities. A strategic relationship between the two is therefore crucial. All the more so because cities are becoming the sites of greatest influence in Canada, because the country's population has recently become more urban than rural, and because innovation in sustainable energy, transportation, infrastructure, environment, housing, health, and more is needed and is happening in cities. This is yet another feature of the University for the Future, one that is intentional about its city relationship. Hence, our MOU with the City of Saskatoon focuses on where our strengths have relevance to the needs of the city, so that together we can, quote, serve and enhance the public good, and through innovative and collaborative solutions, seek to address issues of mutual concern. Another feature of the University for the Future is to achieve meaningful change with and for our communities, our proposed plans, third commitment, inspired communities. There are many ways we're doing this. I'll focus on just a few. The list is much longer than this. Woven into the mission of the College of Dentistry is its commitment to provide dental care to neighborhoods and marginalized groups of Saskatoon. The college has various initiatives to meet those needs, including the Saskatoon West Dental Clinic, the Syrian Refugee Initiative, and the Pediatric Outreach Program. The college is looking to establish eight new dental clinics serving priority populations. Six will serve indigenous communities, two of which might begin this year. One will serve the elder elderly in long-term care and one the developmentally disabled. Our College of Law, in partnership with Nunavut Arctic College and the government of Nunavut, launched its Nunavut Law program last fall. It aims to increase the number of practicing lawyers in Nunavut produce graduates that can practice in various fields of law and improve access to justice there. It will also deliver relevant educational programming to the territory in line with the government of Nunavut's Savumut Ablukta mandate, which is to have more well-educated and self-reliant citizens with a majority of youth graduating from high school, college, or university with the same level of capability as graduates anywhere in Canada. Other examples of achieving meaningful change with and for our communities. The Social Sciences Research Labs and the College of Arts and Science completed a comprehensive research survey called Taking the Pulse. By my count, it's the third in the last 15 years. To document attitudes and opinions on important and controversial issues facing people across this province. 
A representative sample of 400 Saskatchewan residents answered questions about a variety of timely and hot button topics in the province. An ongoing partnership that has continued for 15 years with Post Media allowed the Saskatoon Star Phoenix and the Regina Leader Post to use the new survey data in their Boxing Day editions and to present it in a way that matters to the Saskatchewan public. This spring, the University Art Galleries is launching a campus-wide Indigenous Artist in Residence program with the support of the Humanities Research Unit and the offices of the Vice Provost Teaching and Learning and the Vice Provost Indigenous Engagement. The residency program will feature Indigenous artists exploring the principles of truth and reconciliation at this university with students, staff and faculty. The program is another step in an ongoing partnership between the U of S and Wanuskewin Heritage Park. Our goal of achieving meaningful change with and for our communities led to our acquisition of the Forest Building in Prince Albert across from its City Hall. This gives us the opportunity to bring together many programs we have been running there for years, but under difficult infrastructure conditions for the benefit of that community. The Prince Albert location also provides us with a gateway to the north so that we can expand our course and program offerings to people who live too far from Saskatoon to enable them to otherwise attend university. Nursing, arts and science and medicine are currently, currently among these, but the list will grow because of the improved venue, the larger venue that we have secured. Half of the students currently enrolled in our programs in PA are Indigenous, half of them. And the new building, increase in program offerings and growth in student numbers will benefit Indigenous students and their communities. This community engagement with Prince Albert is also part of a larger reality that our proposed plan's third commitment acknowledges. The C.D. Howe Institute's latest report states that labor market trends show a gradual shift to jobs that require higher skill levels. And that means, basically, that there will be a greater need for university training. Our communities include not only the city, Canada, and beyond, but the province itself. And while Saskatchewan's economy is becoming more knowledge intensive, with 44% of the available jobs in the province requiring the skills and knowledge that a university education provides, only 25% of Saskatchewan's workforce has a university education, underscoring the critical importance of investing in the higher education system and the fact that we are a crucial part of the province's future success. The good news here is that at the U of S, we are training greater numbers of students every year, and we're now up to almost 25,000 students from over a hundred countries. Being the university for the future isn't defined just by student numbers, but by student success, by training students to build that future and supporting them for success in all that they go on to do. And speaking of student success, the U of S was honored to have four of its students receive prestigious 2017 Vanier Canada scholarships, valued at $50,000 per year for three years. Vanier scholarships recognize top-tier PhD students who demonstrate excellence in academia, research impact, and leadership at Canadian universities. Getting four of those at this university is a tremendous achievement that reflects who and what we are, the talent that we have attracted here. Three of these students are Indigenous. In this age of disruption, the pace of innovation today is very fast with new technologies like artificial intelligence, next generation genomics and robotics, displacing established technologies and in the process, changing the way that we think, behave, do business and learn. It was not predicted even 10 years ago, for example, that Saskatoon would be home to a dynamic high tech sector, so hot that we are now racing to even remotely keep pace with the large number of computer scientists this burgeoning sector needs. U of S graduates are driving this. At Salido Design, for example, which designs software to create chips for modern electronics, 53 of their 63 em employees, or 
our U of S graduates. This past fall, in what has been reported to be the largest technology acquisition in Saskatchewan's history, Siemens acquired Solido as part of their strategic investment in virtual simulation and design. Their goal is to make Saskatoon an R&D center for their digital factory division. Interestingly, Siemens cited the presence of our university and our proven ability to provide high quality graduates as a key reason for that acquisition. The jobs today's students need to be prepared for will very likely grow out of innovative university research, both curiosity driven and applied. The U of S, one of Canada's top 15 research universities, is a leader in helping Saskatchewan to stay ahead of the innovation curve. Without curiosity driven research, there is no innovation. Without curiosity driven research, there is no innovation which is the principle behind the Fundamental Science Review report that positively influenced February's federal budget 2018. All of this is why one of our guideposts for the plan's third commitment, Inspired Communities, is amplified contribution to GDP, job creation, and economic security in Saskatchewan and across Canada. With nearly 900 community partnerships in diverse fields in Canada and globally, we are succeeding in connecting the U of S and Saskatchewan with the world. To increase student chances of success in the job market, we're providing more research opportunities for undergraduate students. We're, cre we're increasing the numbers of graduate students. 17% 70, of our student population at the moment is at the graduate level, which puts us eighth highest in the country out of 96 universities and exactly in the middle of the U15 and we're creating more work placements for our students. Countless business ideas have been generated on our campus in a diverse range of disciplines and more than 70 businesses have now been established, not just as startups, have been established by members of the U of S community in just the last few years. In sum, we are working to address specific community challenges and to equip students with the skills and training they need for tomorrow's jobs through discoveries through spin-offs, and through graduating truly innovative thinkers and problem solvers. These examples help to demonstrate why the U of S leads Canada's 96 universities when it comes to per capita economic impact on the surrounding region. Leads all 96 universities. And they show why we can say with confidence that our proposed plan's third commitment, Inspired Communities, will involve distinguishing the university as an essential community partner by growing and documenting our impact on prosperity, quality of life, and student success. Being a university for the future means being the university the world needs. That is a gesture of respect for the communities we believe we can work with, the partnerships we can build, the challenges that we can help meet. Foundational to the proposed plan is the principle of Nikanatan Manasitawinik, let us lead with respect. In this country, no university is going to be for the future if it does not participate in ongoing efforts toward reconciliation. When we speak of the greatest challenges and opportunities that we are prepared to meet, making good on the TRC's calls to action presents Canada with one of them. It's an opportunity because with commitment and strong leadership, Canada will emerge more unified, healthier, and more inclusive than it has ever been. When the U of S held Canada's first national forum on building reconciliation two years ago, the fourth will be in Victoria this November, TRC Chair Murray Sinclair said that education is the key to reconciliation. If so, a lot of work needs to be done. About 27% of Canadians have a university degree, but fewer than 10% of Indigenous people do. If access to a quality education is a sign of a just society, that's injustice in action. The U of S is committed to increasing the number of Indigenous students it registers, supports for success, 
and graduates, registers, supports for success, and graduates. We are seeing improvement in this regard annually. We have reached an enrollment figure of 3,100 for self-declared Indigenous students, up 28% over the last five years, a period during which our overall student population grew by comparison 3%, an encouraging figure in and of itself. And if we were having a meeting such as this in the Maritimes, we would not bring offering those kinds of figures. Our role in Canada's journey to reconciliation involves more than increasing the graduation rates and numbers of Indigenous students, however. Our proposed plan commits us to, very carefully thought out here, growth in the number of Indigenous policies, programs, curricula, and initiatives across colleges and schools developed with and validated by Indigenous peoples, end quote. This is not to supplant traditional Western understanding, but to enrich it, acknowledge thousands of years of deep learning that occurred here prior to it, and give all students a more informed and ultimately more compassionate understanding of the world. It commits us to Indigenous leadership at all levels of the academy, administration, and governance. It commits us to changing our systems and structures, including tenure, promotion, and merit practices, to recognize indigenization. It commits us to seeing strong evidence of initiatives that respond to the TRC calls to action. Through these commitments to Nakanatan Manasitawinik, leading with respect, the U of S will be an even better university. A challenge of this magnitude means being purposeful and committed. It means not, rec not just reconciliation, but reconciliation. It will take time and a careful mix of patience and impatience, but I am reminded of Senator Sinclair's statement that if we agree on the objective of reconciliation and agree to work together, the work we do today will immeasurably strengthen the social fabric of Canada tomorrow. That statement about tomorrow fits well with our commitment to being the university for the future. It will require us to stay focused on our plan in the face of budgetary pressures. That is why the timing of our vision document and now our university plan is so good. And it will require us to acknowledge and broadcast at the same time all the positive change we are leading with respect and the immense contributions we are making and have the capacity to make. So I want to thank everybody here and the U of S community at large for an outstanding academic year in the face of financial adversity, a year during which, again, excellence was achieved and our value to the city, province, and beyond was demonstrated. Thank you very much.